Well, hello, this is Mike O'Connor. I decided to do me a little video about a gizmo that I've dreamed up. and So here it is. This is version 1.0. We'll see where this goes. This is all about Fraxan. And I just thought I'd start off the way all presentations seem to, with a little discussion of who I am. There's me. See, I'm not the devil incarnate. I'm just this guy that's working on this. Most of the time this is where I hang out. I'm a geek. There's, this is where I'm sitting right now. And uh, just to give you a little of the geek history, a long time ago in the 70s I started WORT in Madison. Later became a ham radio guy. KZ0C is my call. Went to a big fancy East Coast school. Worked for a couple of big accounting consulting firms, was a crisis manager at the University of Minnesota where I wound up being, among other things, the controller because I had to fix a bunch of accounting type stuff. And that's where I discovered the internet. There's a picture of the internet I like and after I quit at the U I started along with my buddy Ralph in the O'Connor family basement, I started a ISP called GoFast.net. Later got appointed to the Minnesota High Speed Broadband Task Force by the governor. And these days I hang out with an outfit called ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, where I do mostly security and stability stuff. I threw this up on the screen just to give you a sense that I do like to draw pictures of things, sort of get one great big complicated issue out there on the in a drawing. Those are the kind of drawings I do. As you can see, this is something that I can do pretty much anywhere because I'm a geek and I work on internet stuff. But the reason that we're here is really because of Marcy. When we bought a farm in Oh, right around the year 2000 and have been converting it back to the prairies that it was before this area was settled in the 1850s. And this is sort of what our place looks like. This is a view from above our house and this is a view from the front standing on Highway 88. More about Highway 88 in a minute. This is a view from one of the big fields up on top that Marcy's converted back to prairie. And that would be the end of this video were it not for the arrival of frac sand in the county about a year ago. And the issue that really got me going was roads. So let me show you a little video. This is the road that I'm all worked up about. This is Highway 88, just north of where we live. And I'll just play this video for you so you get a sense of what's going on. I don't know how the sound will work out. The video may complicate things. But anyway, you can see this truck going down this very narrow little road. This is a state highway. It's a long story as to why this tiny little road is still a state highway. But you can see it's not in very good shape. What you can't see is that the drop off to the right there in some places is about 150 feet. So if this truck came a up against something coming the other way or if somebody uh, coming the other way came up against this truck they could roll over a lot of times before they came to a stop. And the big thing that I want to show you is how the wheels of the truck in the front, the cab part, are always staying within the lines, but you can see how the back doesn't. And it turns out that the DOT has done a study that shows that no semi can go over this road without crossing the center line. And so when the people who in the background down that valley proposed to run all their trucks over this road, a lot of us said, that's crazy. And Highway 88 is like this a lot. It's not just here. 
it's uh, it's a windy road for the 30 miles or so that it takes to get to the Mississippi, and we think it's a really bad idea to run a lot of trucks filled with sand down a road that's in this kind of condition and this kind of geometry. Well, anyway, that's that's the story of how I got involved, and you that link at the bottom has this whole video. It's a little jerky on the screen here, but it's much better when you get it through YouTube. You can watch the rest of the video on your own. I just wanted to show you a picture of the way the road looked a couple of days ago. Marcy and I take a walk and go out to the front pretty much every day, and a couple of days ago it was foggy and it had just sort of rained or snowed or something. You can see that that's all ice and stuff. It's just not a real good road for a lot of trucks, that's all. So that's that's our story. I'm sticking with that. A lot of you have been on this road with us on this frac sand issue. You know that uh, this has been going on in Buffalo County for about a year. And I've gotten to the point of starting to draw one of my pictures. Standard default PowerPoint color scheme there. Before I take you through the picture, I thought I'd tell you just a little joke. You see, when people disagree, at first they think, well, the other person's just uninformed. And so if I give them a lot of facts, that'll bring them around to my point of view. So they do. They tell people lots of facts and figures and stuff like that. And when the disagreement persists, then the people start to think, well, maybe the other person's just stupid. So maybe if I tell them the facts again, maybe talk really slow and really loud, maybe they'll get it. And then when they still disagree, they start thinking that the other person is evil. And it seems to me that that's sort of where we've gotten here in Buffalo County, and I think actually across the region. And I also think that we really have to step back from that. I think we've got to come at this a different way. And I'll tell you the story why during the rest of this little video. So here we go. Here's my story. There's really these three groups. There's citizens, industry, and government. And if you look around as these little things pop in, the citizens are perceived to feel that the ideal solution is no minds at all. And you can see all the little things that... I, actually, those phrases around the outside I've <laughs> had reported to me as being said within the, the county government of Buffalo County. We won't go there, but it's not pretty. I think it's safe to say that the same goes for the industry. They're viewed as sort of these rapacious, greedy destroyers. And um, the government isn't perceived real well either. Uh, at best, I think they're perceived as bumblers, and at worst, they are thought to be lining their own pockets and those of their friends. And unfortunately, I think there's some truth to all of that which means that basically where we're at is sort of the classic confrontation between fear and greed. And I think there's a lot of those two emotions on both sides of this issue, which is a pretty toxic combination, unfortunately. So let's talk about what that means. I think, I think where we're at after a year of this is that there are two problems. One is there's a lot of waste. Uh, and I think all three sides of this are feeling that. Citizens are spending a lot of time and in some cases a lot of money uh, essentially being their own uh, attorney generals. You know, that they're doing what a good government ought to, ought to be able to do for them. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of work. I think also that the problem from the advocate standpoint is that 
basically they face a lottery right now, at least in Buffalo County. If you were to ask me which mines are going to get approved and which ones aren't, and which ones are actually going to start working and which ones aren't, I would have to flip a coin because it's very difficult to predict how these things are going to go. If I was an applicant, that would I would be beside myself because there's no way to plan a business. There's no way to get financing when you're confronting that kind of situation. And then clearly, um, you know, governments are overwhelmed. Again, here our little county government, we've had tremendous turnover in staff. We've got a county board that's confronting an issue that's way beyond their capability. And I, I would think that they would characterize themselves as overwhelmed. I'm not sure, uh, but that would be my guess. I think the other problem is that we're awfully polarized right now. Even families are divided on this issue. Um, I think that, yeah, the applicant industry community is also polarized. I think that there's quite a deep division between sort of the mainstream, moderately responsible ones and the newcomer, freelancer, wildcatters who are poisoning the well. And at the government level, there's clearly uh, a leadership void. Uh, more on that later, but, uh, you know, as a result, uh, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of polarization, even in the government community. I think all of that means that we need to take a step back and take a look at underlying drivers for this. So I threw six out there as a hypothesis. I'm not sure this is entirely right, but I bet it's close. Um, I'll sort of step through these once and then I'll give you some examples of what I mean. You know, from the citizen standpoint, we are really concerned about two kinds of issues. We are really fearful about health and safety, and we are really fearful about property rights. Um, our rights to have businesses and our and the value of the land and, and houses that we own that in many cases are our primary investment for our retirements or it's certainly the nest egg. I think from a, an industry standpoint, you know, I started several businesses and sold a couple of them. And so I kind of know my way about, around being an entrepreneur. And, and it seems to me that there are two drivers there. One is clearly you got to be successful as a business, but I think there's also kind of a corporate citizenship driver that drives most businesses. Um, and then government, I sort of put up two. I think economic development and the continuing viability of the county is clearly a big deal. And then uh, government uh, also has a bunch of services and infrastructure that they need to deliver. And here are the little examples, uh, starting with the industry folks. You know, I think there's, in addition to financial results, I think there's also got to be quality results. I am a TQM devotee, and I think quality rolls into how successful a business is going to be. In terms of corporate citizenship, I think there's really two big things. There's ethics and then stewardship. From the citizen point of view, uh, you know, I'm in the traffic camp. That's where I pay all my attention, pretty much. But clearly, in the health and safety area, there are other things like water and air quality as well that people are very concerned about. And then in the property rights area, there's clearly just the value of the property that we own and the quality of life that we want to live. But there's also a lot of people who are quite fearful that this influx of sand mining is going to destroy the viability of their business, uh, many of which are based on tourism and the scenic beauty of this area, and having a whole bunch of 
really ugly mines and a whole lot of trucks going through areas that are really structured a different way is going to present a big problem for people. And then uh, just to round out the government, you know, there's jobs and amenities in the economic development quadrant and there's schools and roads in the services and infrastructure piece. So after I started drawing this, I started thinking about areas where maybe we can agree. And I think there's three of them. And I think actually all three quadrants could probably come to agreement around these three things. I sort of arrayed them the way I did so that the two groups that probably care the most had the one they cared the most about between them. So, for example, I think between citizens and government, the place that we can agree and work the best is probably the good government uh, topic. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've got a serious problem here. If we don't get this tidied up, we've, we've got nothing but trouble ahead of us. I think if you look between industry and government, what needs to happen there is some sort of predictable process so that it's not a lottery. And I'll, I'll have more to say about that in a minute. And then I think between industry and citizens, we've got to get away from this win-lose stuff. Uh, this polarizing, you know, either I win or you win, but not both of us. It, you know, if we continue with this model, uh, it's going to be an ugly five years, I think. So, I, you know, this is just a stepping stone, I think. It's a start. I don't think this is necessarily right, but it's a first try. And I think that where we need to really focus is on something that's balanced between all three of us and somehow responsible. Um, so, there you go. That's the model. And the question is, well, so where can we start? What can we do to kind of get going on this? And so let me throw four things at you. Uh, let me tell you that under no circumstances am I suggesting that I'm unilaterally stepping back. Uh, I want to see some good faith meeting in the middle before I throw down all my tools. But... I'd be willing to talk about this stuff. So let's start with the code of conduct. Um, I, I've run into the folks from WISA, Wisconsin Industrial Sand Association. And that group was formed uh, by, I think, four of the pretty established sand mining companies in the state. And one of the things that they really hang their hat on is the code of conduct that they think should govern uh, the way these outfits behave, and I like their code of conduct. I went and read it, thought about it for a while, and it gets a really good one. But I want to show you some pictures of a sand mine that are, is, I took these two days ago. And this is a WISA member. This is the Segerstrom mine on Highway 37 here in Buffalo County, and I am up on Sand Road. 37 is between that mine and us. It's down in the valley there. You can't really see it. And, you know, I got cool camera and cool toys, so I got zoomed in and, you know, there's, there's the mine. Now this group, a year ago when they got this permit, told us, oh, you know, we're not we're not going up the bluff. Well, that's not what, you know, that's not where the sand is. We want to be down. You know, we won't we won't create a visual problem for you. And I beg to differ. And the reason I threw this up here is because these folks are WISA members. And I don't think that this particular operation conforms with the WISA code of conduct. So this is sort of a little message to WISA that says... Uh, I'm, I'm in trust but verify mode, and so far you're not 
overwhelming me with your performance here. Uh, I'm going to stick with WISA a little bit because one of the things that they say in their code of conduct is that they're all about ethics, and I'm all for that. I've come from a culture of the big eight consulting accounting firms that's pretty heavy duty about ethics, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking that ethics could do a lot to solve some of the problems that we're facing, but again, let me start out with a WISA member, that same company that runs the Seekerstrom mine, hired our zoning administrator right after that mine was approved. And so he got in the newspaper <laughs> because it doesn't look real good. And so again, I think ethics is a great place to stand, but I think we've got a lot of work to do before we get there. Now here's another little ethical issue that popped up here in Buffalo County. In this case, it was the president of the local bank who went off and bought himself some land. And turns out that land might make a really good loading facility for sand. And he got himself in the newspaper too. So. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't any way out of this, but I think we've got to work harder on this, folks, because if we don't, it's going to be a long, tough haul. Let's talk about that lottery that we've got right now. I, you know, it seems to me that one of the huge steps that we're making here in Buffalo County, we had a great meeting a couple of weeks ago of the zoning committee where it would appear that we're starting to have the possibility of a pretty good conversation about how to do this sand mining approval process. And I applaud the people that put that together. But let me show you where we're starting from. This is a proposed sign-up sheet for a sand mine that wants to put in a multi-million dollar operation that affects lots and lots of people in the county. And they can do it with a two-page form, at least the way it stands right now. And this is, I think, the source of part of the lottery problem. And that is that this process that we've got right now is so sketchy, and the people that are doing it are under so much pressure that basically whoever loses uh, has a target rich environment to go to court. So in, in the case of a sand mine that was approved near me, the process was such a travesty that I went to court. And I'm here to tell you this broke my unbroken streak of running organizations as large as 15,000 people and never having a lawsuit. Here I am, 10 years retired, in my first lawsuit. It's making me cranky. Because I, I really don't think that these kinds of problems are best solved in court. But if in court is the only option, then that's where we'll go. So, again, I think a really good process would help us a lot, and I think that Buffalo County Zoning Group has at least made one good step. I hope it continues. And uh, finally, uh, I just want to point out that I've talked to people at all kinds of levels of government about this, town level, uh, county level, state level, and everybody seems to think that it's their level that's going to solve this, and I want to show you a picture that shows why that's not true. This is a regional problem where we're going to have to work across all kinds of layers of government in order to get this fixed. This is a, pic a picture that I've drawn for quite a long time. It just shows a bad situation here in Buffalo County. This is one that we got defeated last year. We'll see if we can continue on that. But the, the reason I threw this picture up is, look, there's multiple counties. There's dozens of towns. And there's two states involved in this problem. 
And so we, we've got to get some sense of regionalism going here. We've got to build some sort of leadership cadre that can talk across all these boundaries, figure these things out together, figure out a, a, an approach that will work for all the folks in all of those counties, in all of those states, in all of those towns, uh, if we're going to get through this. Because right now, it's divide and conquer. Um, again, a, a pretty bad situation. So here we are. Not a very pretty picture. Uh, what I hope to do with this video, and I'm just about done now, is paint a picture that shows where we're going, which I think looks like this and at least a few steps on how to get there. So, there you go, that's the video of the day, and I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it was so long. I try to keep these a little bit shorter, but this is kind of a big bite to take. There's my email address, and I'd love to hear from you. If you don't know me, maybe we can figure something out. See you later.